Awesome. I think we're going to get started. I want to thank you all for coming here today. Uh, this event is hosted in conjunction with the Senate Cybersecurity Caucus and the Congressional Internet Caucus. The co-chairs of the Senate Cybersecurity Caucus are Senator Cory Gardner and Senator Mark Warner, my boss. And the co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus are Senator John Thune and Senator Patrick Leahy, and on the House side, Congressman Bob Goodlatte and Congressman Ann Eshoo. Uh, we are thrilled to have the caucuses come together to host this today, and want to thank the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy for hosting us today. Thank you so much, Tim, for all your help. I want to uh, introduce uh, someone who is a mentor to me, who will then introduce uh, a number of other mentors uh, to folks like me and to many other staffers on the Hill. Katie Mazuris is the founder and CEO of Luda Security. She grew up hacking with the uh, folks from uh, The Loft in the late 80s and early 90s in the Boston hacking scene. She is the co-author and editor of multiple ISO standards on vulnerability disclosure and the leading expert on establishing coordinated vulnerability disclosure policies in industry. Uh, she was the creator of Microsoft's first bug bounty and the advisor who helped DOD launch Hack the Pentagon. So without further ado, I want to introduce Casey, uh, Katie to introduce our panel. Well, thank you, Rafi, and uh, thank you, all of you, for joining us here today. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to ask the esteemed members of the loft to kindly take their seats. But um, just give you a little housekeeping. If you want to be tweeting about today's event, tweeting is welcome. And the hashtag is loft20. How many of you need me to spell that for you? OK, OK, you know, Kingpin has requested that I spell it for you, L0PHT20. That is, that is the hashtag. So um, I'm going to do a quick intro. And as I intro you briefly, um, please come up and take your seats. So first off, we'll have Chris Weldpond Weisopel, Chief Technology Officer of uh, CA Vericode, taking the stage. And then followed by Chris Space Rogue Thomas, X-Force Red Global Strategy Lead, IBM. Uh, Peter Mudge Zatko, Head of Security for Stripe. And finally, Joe Kingpin Grand, Product Designer and Founder of Grand Idea Studio. All right, let's give these guys a round of applause as they make their way to the days. So, I, well, you know, I called y'all in order, but, you know, this one isn't paying attention. So. The, first of all, I just want to give a little bit of context for this event. How many of you had seen the original Loft testimony, historically spoken just a few days ago, 20 years ago? Right, so um, that was history in the making. That was the first time our people had been called uh, to testify publicly about the fragility of the internet. And if you think the internet was fragile 20 years ago, well, We've probably got some updates that will make you both happy and sad um, today. So uh, I think there is an important clip that really set the tone. It's probably the most quoted little clip that we have seen um, come out of that original testimony. And um, I just want, if they're ready, for them to play that short clip back for you today. Uh, so we appreciate your coming here, especially in light of the fact that the Washington Post described you as rock stars of the computer hacking elite. Uh, so uh, we appreciate uh, your being with us here today. Um, I'm informed that you uh, think that it, within 30 minutes the seven of you could uh, make the internet unusable for the entire nation. Is that correct? That's correct. Actually, one of us with just a few packets. Um, I, we've, we've told a few agencies about this. Uh, it's kind of funny because we think that this is something that the various government agencies should be actively going after. We know the Department of Defense just did a very large uh, um, investigation into what's known as denial of service attacks against the infrastructure. Uh, in our various day jobs, we contributed a large portion of the information to that. Uh, actual um, investigation. Uh, much to our chagrin, the learnings from it were instantly classified, uh, which we were giving them largely public information. Uh, it, it is very trivial with the old protocols to segregate and separate the different major long-haul providers, uh, which would then be the national access points, the metropolitan area ether uh, sections, AT&T can't talk to MCI, can't talk to PSINet, can't talk to Alternet, et cetera, et cetera, and keep it down that way as long as we really wanted to. Uh, 
Okay. It would definitely take a few days for people to figure out. I think that's enough doom and gloom from 20 years out. ago. Yes, we can, so we can, so we can look back and we can see that a few things may have changed, notably in the hair department um, in 20 years. Yeah, and um, so for one, I want to give everybody on the panel um, their chance to, to basically talk through what they've learned and their statements. So why don't we go ahead and start with Space Rogue. I thought you were going to start in the middle, but that's okay. Uh, so my name is Space Rogue. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, out of fear of corporate retaliation and through lawsuits mostly, uh, Space Rogue was pretty much the only name that I used. Right. Today, I also use the name Chris Thomas, uh, although not as frequently. Uh, and I work as the global security strategy, the global strategy lead for IBM's X Force Red, uh, which is the offensive security services part of IBM Security. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how things have changed in information security over the last 20 years. Uh, when we were here 20 years ago, a lot of people said we were a voice of reason, attempting to warn people about just how much risk was inherent in our critical systems. A lot of people in information security, or I guess we call it cyber security now, uh, that's one thing that's changed right there, uh, will tell you that nothing has changed. Uh, that we still have issues with passwords, from password reuse to weak passwords to no passwords. We still have organizations who ignore the problems, uh, either through ignorance, ambivalence, or just greed. And we still have people who try to blame users for technological failures. When I was here 20 years ago, I talked about and touched on a lot of different topics. I talked about the weakness in access control cards. I talked about software liability. I talked about the rise of nation state attackers. And I talked about the lack of authentication and ease in jamming GPS signals. I also mentioned that the goal of information or cybersecurity should not be to make something 100% secure because I still don't believe such a system is possible. 20 years ago, the possibility of cloning an access control card to gain entry into a building was a known risk, but was considered to be so difficult that no one would do it. And it was an acceptable risk. Cloning access cards today is much easier, but attackers still most likely will just sneak in behind someone else or tailgate them because that's even easier. Software liability was a concept that was seldom even thought about 20 years ago. Today, the increase in software and all sorts of devices from self-driving cars to medical devices and the issue of liability of who is ultimately respons responsible for bad code, code that can actually kill people, is being weighed out in our courts. Over the last 20 years, nation state attackers have become the predominant threat for many organizations, something that was almost unheard of 20 years ago. The nation state threat is more than just compromising networks and endpoints. Today, it focuses on much more on information gathering, disinformation, and just plain old propaganda. You can look no further than the evening news every night right now to see examples of that. GPS has become critical to our way of life, and yet the risks remain the same. We now depend on GPS not only for flight navigation, but for personal car navigation. GPS is also used by emergency services to locate uh, a phone from someone who may be in distress. Military applications of GPS have received some improvements, especially with the recent introduction of M code into the GPS architecture. But risks through signal spoofing and authentication controls remain. However, it's not all doom and gloom. Some things have changed for the better. Today, we have a lot more information available to us if we want it. We have greater ability to inventory not only our endpoints, but what exactly is running on our networks. We can know with certainty what our critical data is and where it lives. We can analyze traffic with more speed and precision with much lower cost than we could just a few years ago. This visibility into our infrastructure is critical in identifying and eliminating risk. Once we know what systems we have in place, where our data lives, then we can prioritize our remediation efforts. We can deploy our scarce resources into making our systems more resilient in an effective way. Instead of just applying fixes or new defenses in some random fashion, we have the information available to us today, if we choose to gather it, to make educated decisions about how best to apply our limited resources. And once those resources have been deployed, we can then shore up our defenses. Our ability to we have the ability to test our implementations, both manually and with automated tools. And that ability is continuously improving. Testing our defenses, whether through code review, penetration testing, red teaming, or other methods, 
is just as important as deploying our defenses in the first place. Our testing abilities, knowing what to test and how to replicate real-world attacks gets better every day. We've learned a lot of lessons over the last 20 years. For example, we know that flat networks are not a very good idea. <laughs> we know that segmentation and compartmentalization when it comes to network design makes things much more difficult for an attacker when they are deployed correctly. We have learned that using strong encryption whenever feasible is a really good idea. And that while strong encryption still isn't always easy, it's a lot better and more prevalent than it was even 10 years ago. And we have learned that using multi-factor authentication whenever possible makes an attacker's life that much more difficult. Even when the implementation of those other factors may have weaknesses themselves, anything in addition to a single pass, simple password makes the attacker's job just that much harder. And while network design, encryption, multi-factor authentication are not necessarily new things, they all existed for a lot longer than 20 years, they have become much more ubiquitous in today's environment and have gone a long way in making the world a more secure place. The government has learned as well. Look at the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is a policy framework developed by a wide range of people involved in cybersecurity from both the public and the private sector working together. The framework helps organizations of all types assess their environment and use that knowledge to be proactive about risk management. Such advanced thinking from government about information security was pretty much hard to find 20 years ago. Our problem today isn't so much that we don't know how to make things more secure, it's that we're not applying that knowledge evenly. For every organization that implements multi-factor authentication, there's another one that is running old, outdated, and unpatched operating systems. For every organization that is properly encrypting all its data, there is another one that isn't and has a web-facing database vulnerable to SQLI. For every organization, every organization has limited resources, but today we can have a lot more information available to us that allows us to deploy those resources appropriately. We know we have greater ability to test those deployments to ensure they are installed correctly, and we now have technologies and policies that make an attacker's job much more difficult. And so while we can't ever make something 100% secure, hopefully over the next 20 years we can use the knowledge we already have and the knowledge that we will gain to create a much more secure world for everyone. Thank you so much, Space Rogue. No problem. <laughs> so uh, before I move to the next, uh, our next star loft member panelist, I want to highlight the fact that 20 years later we're still talking about some of the same threats. We're just we're just talking about the defensive side of what we've learned in these 20 years. And notably, every single one of us up here are former at stake, where I believe one of our very honest marketing ads said, you will never be 100% secure. That's always going to be true. So with that, take it away, Weld. There we go. Um, hi, my name's uh, Weld Pond, or I mostly go by Chris Weisopel. Um, that's how I know if someone really knows me from way back, they call me Weld. Um, so uh, my, my, uh, my job right now is I'm the uh, CTO and co-founder of CA Vericode. I started Vericode in 2006 uh, with uh, Christian Ryu, also known as Dildog, uh, another, another uh, Loft member. And um, we started it to help you know, make software more secure. Um, and took a lot of the learnings from, from my early days at the loft into, in, into, into doing that. Um, but back in 1998, you know, we were outsiders. Uh, we were curious people um, learning about the systems out there um, that uh, we used every day, Windows 95. Um, and we wanted to understand how networked and technology worked, and we found problems along the way as we explored. So I, I think the root of, of, of being a hacker is really is, is exploring, and that's really how we got started. But we found problems, and what do you do when you find a problem, right? The right thing to do is to, you know, help other people who have that problem. So we started off, you know, thinking we were going to help users. We we're going to help users and uh, of, of technology become aware of these problems. Um, and in course of doing that, we started making the vendors that made the technology pretty upset. Um, and I think that's how we originally got our notoriety, was pointing out really that the emperor had no clothes, that no one was making secure systems back then, and we were discovering really huge gaping holes in, in the systems that people, people were using. Um, and we, we were using our outsider attacker perspective to do that, something that the vendors didn't know how to do. 
They didn't, they, they, they couldn't, you can't be a critic of yourself. It's very hard to do that. So that's when we started to realize that this outsider view, adversarial view, critic view was something that was actually absolutely critical to, um, to building secure systems. And it, it had to become part of the way we thought about um, security. And so we started to move slowly from, with that perspective, moving to actually start to work with vendors. There was one day uh, Microsoft sent us an email and said, you know, guys, if you don't publish the stuff on bug track right away, if you give us time to fix it, we'll fix it. And then you can, um, pub we'll publish the information once you've, you know, put a patch out there. And that really kind of started the whole thing of let's start to, we can help users and we can help society if we start working with the vendors. But that was a big change for us because we were outsiders. And it took the industry years to come to grips with hackers poking holes in their systems. You know, they would threaten with lawsuits. They would want you to just be quiet. They liked the system of the silent fix where you told them the problem. They fixed it silently and they pretended it never happened, right? Um, but we kind of said that that, that, that isn't going to work because the people who have the, the, the vulnerable system don't know that the silent patch is available. So we kind of um, were, were, were learning along with the vendors how we should do this, you know, coordination um, back there. And then eventually um, the hacker world got accepted, right? First we got thanked in bulletins um, and then later companies had bug bounties to actually pay people to do that. So over sort of a 10 year period we went from, you know, please go away, you're horrible, to thank you very much, here's some money. Um, and I think that's been the biggest transition, how the hacker community has started to, to, to help, um, help industry. You know, we started being adversarial, and then our first jobs were being, you know, the red team. You know, when we started at stake, we were external penetration testers. And then we became internal penetration testers. And then hackers started to get hired by banks to be internal uh, penetration testers. One of the loft guys actually went and worked for one of the largest banks in the world as an internal penetration tester. And so there's this, been this progression from outsider to insider, and now um, we're even on the, what we call the blue team, right? You've got hackers thinking about, how do I stop the red team? How do I use my adversarial mindset to come up with detection and defenses against that? And now I think in the last few years, where the final progression is, and I heard this actually today, the yellow team. Have you heard the yellow team? Which is, I call it security engineering. That's when the person with the hacker mindset actually becomes a builder and works with the architects, works with the developers, the designers, to actually build the security directly in. And this is how you end up with Chrome being such a strong um, browser from a security perspective. This is how you end up with iOS being so strong. This is what Mudge does at Stripe. Hopefully he's going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and, and it's not just working on those teams, but it's building tools with that mindset that, um, that attackers, um, I'm sorry, that builders can use, which is what, what, what Dildog and myself are doing at Veracode, is building tools that people building systems um, can use. But now um, I, I want to mention a couple other things I think were interesting from our hearing that that uh, kind of resonate today. So uh, Senator Thompson asked us, if a foreign power hired people like us, what damage could we do? And uh, we started talking about moving satellites and jamming GPS and you know hurting critical infrastructure. And I went back to how I was thinking about that back then and it would all seem so theoretical. The idea that a nation state would have a team of guys like us and they would be attacking the United States. It seemed very theoretical, but we all know, like 20 years later, um, this, is, this is happening constantly. Um, the first, one of the first big attacks, um, uh, the DDoS attacks, um, which were pointed to Iran being the, the, the perpetrator of those um, about 10 years ago, um, was, was exactly that. It was nation states doing DDoS attacks just like we talked about, but it took time I guess for everyone else to get on board that, that uh, yeah, this is a fun way to attack other countries. Um, so, you know, that, that's something that was theoretical then and, and is, 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 is real 
uh, absolutely real now, and it's even much beyond nation states, right? There's all kinds of criminal organizations at every tier building tools, running dark web, you know, making a business out of the vulnerabilities. So we talked about the vulnerabilities in 98 and talked about the, you know, sort of the threat actors kind of theoretically. What's really changed is the threat space, right? Is there's so many more threat actors now. It's not just, you know, back then the threat was like the quote teenage hacker. It was kind of like, yeah, they're kind of ankle biters, they're a pain in the ass. That was how it was in 98. And now it's nation states. So every vulnerability got, got a lot more risky um, because of that. The other thing I thought uh, you know, was interesting back then was, uh, was uh, when Senator Glenn was talking, um, and my favorite part of the testimony when Senator Glenn looked over to us, he says, boys, do you know that I'm a pilot? And we said, yes, sir. Um, but uh, so Senator Glenn asked us, because we talked about you know, software should be more secure, maybe vendors should be liable if they make software that causes problems. And um, uh, he said, shouldn't vendors be allowed to sell a secure version of their software and a less secure version of their software? At the time, the thinking was like, Windows NT is the secure version, Windows 95 is not. And basically what we said was, they're both insecure. They say it's secure, but it's not. So it's all kind of insecure. So this idea that they should be allowed to make an insecure and a secure version, you know, the mindset of a lot of people is like, well, you make a safe car and less safe cars, you know, that the market should allow that. Um, but it just doesn't really work with software. Um, and I, I think we've, we, we've seen that, we've seen that today. Um, so I, I just want to end on one final thing, because uh, I, I knew they were going to show the clip of, um, of, of the take the, take the internet down in 30 minutes. And, um, you know, people have asked over and over again, you know, when we look back, can you still do that today, right? And what we were, what we were talking about, one of the problems was the BGP protocol is, is unauthenticated. And it's easy to spoof BGP packets if you can get on the right network. Um, and uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a BGP attack that someone did on a, uh, on a crypto wallet. It was called My Ether Wallet. And so that same problem from 20 years ago, which seemed largely theoretical, why would anyone take the internet down, just a few weeks ago is being used to steal money from people's crypto wallets. And they redirected traffic to a fake My Ether Wallet website. And people were depositing uh, Bitcoin into, in, into the fake site. So, um, you know, I don't want to end on a totally sour note, but yeah, some of those things are, are still there. Um, we're still building um, new technology like cryptocurrency and blockchain with all its promise of being secure on old network foundation that's insecure. We all know sites can be spoofed and sites can be hacked and wallets can be built insecurely. And we sort of keep building new things on old infrastructure that never ever seems to change or ever, ever seems to get fixed. Um, so that's why I feel like my job is not done yet. I don't think anyone up here thinks their job is done yet. And that's why you know, I'm glad to hear, come here today and hopefully answer some of your questions. Thanks, Weld. And um, before we move down the line to Mudge, a, a couple of things struck me about what you just said. And it's the evolution of not the technology itself, but how it's been used and the theoretical attacks moving into the practical, and the, the highlighted bit that you just mentioned, highlighting the same attack type as what you uh, called out 20 years ago, the biggest difference is that, of course, it's going after money, you know, and the threats and the, the actual attackers and the bad actors were never really us. Right? They were never really the hackers who were willing to come to the U.S. Senate, even under pseudonym. But the, the real attackers um, you know, were growing and evolving, and the threat model was evolving. And we've got a very young internet built on pretty much silly string and uh, rock and roll. So with that, I'm going to lead it over to Mudge, who had the most rock and roll hair 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Before I start, I did want to point out that you're probably going to hear a lot of things about doom and gloom today, and hopefully you're going to hear a lot of suggestions about how to protect yourself or good security hygiene. One of the things I'd ask you to look out for is where are the measurements of those? How are we quantifying what's working and 
what's not. A lot of things feel like they're the right security thing to do, but it turns out when you actually measure it, a lot of it's counterintuitive. There are a lot of perverse incentive structures. Um, so even in my part here, I mean, I, I challenge you, go through life thinking about why do we keep getting hit by the same things, how much money have we spent to defend it, what was the impact, what was the cost, how do we start to measure what works and what so with that, um, when I first testified, there really wasn't a lot of public knowledge about security um, it's computer vulnerabilities in general. And at that testimony, I was the one who shared uh, the now infamous BGP attack because I was the one who had done the work and written the BGP attack. Also the one that uh, Senator Glenn or Senator Thompson was saying, um, uh, trying to educate the intel community behind the scenes. Um, the reason DGP was important there, and I'll get back to this in just a bit, is that it's part of what's become now our digital critical infrastructure, which is different than the software you're running. We all want to hear you better. Can you move the mic a little closer? Thanks. How's that? Mm -hmm. I was able to speak with authority back then, 20 some odd years ago, because already I had kind of helped with the discovery and dissemination of two classes of all offer overflows to race conditions, object reuse, by channels to me. Many years after that, I went and ran offensive and defensive uh, cyber programs for the Department of Defense of Community on DARPA, the Corporate Vice President of Engineering, Deputy Director of Advanced Technology Projects Group, um, started a nonprofit consumer watch group, uh, Cyber ITL. Most recently, I run security uh, at one of the world's in tech companies. To me, the problem is pretty obvious across these 20 years. And that's the number of products with measurably good security is exceedingly small. But unlike 20 years ago, what I'm going to try and focus on today is that there are some examples out there. This is progress, and what can we learn from them? How can we replicate? So, when a whole industry or nation spends incredible amounts of money, over long periods of time and throws a lot of really, really smart people at a problem, but it still keeps feeling like we're failing and we haven't closed on the problem, you really have to step back and say, why? You know, what was it that we actually missed? Well, I see a few things. First, the attempts that we've made for security standards and certifications to date largely are about what feels right rather than data showing what makes something strong in a security sense. The few, security com the few companies that do security right in industry today are not the companies that are blindly following business process certifications like EAL, CMMI, VIPS 140, or that have a UL sort of pass-fail you know, pass rating. Second, it's extremely difficult for the consumer, and the consumer could be URI, or it could be an entire corporation or government, to actually differentiate products and solutions with good security hygiene from those lacking it. There's very little transparency in the products, and there's a lot of marketing instead. In other words, where's the equivalent of the National Transportation Safety uh, Board crash test results for the software that you're consuming? Where are the nutritional labels uh, that you have on the side of your food for the software that you're buying and putting into your systems and services? Not saying something is pass or fail, not saying something is good or bad, but what is it made of so that you can make an informed decision as to whether or not it's going to be effective or change your risk profile or allow you to do what you want to do in what you want. And the third, and this goes back to the kind of critical di digital infrastructure, is that EGP, DNS, SSL, things like that, those have become public safety issues. They really have. Um, cyber, that, I gotta say, it, cyber that uses, you know, that, that we all depend on, runs and powers our energy, communications, transportation, and financial systems. So why has this been almost entirely left to the free market to secure and make safe? So, there is hope. There are some consumer watch groups, like the Cyber ITL I mentioned, Consumer Reports, and Ford Foundation that are starting to actually provide unbiased insight into practices that work, provide quantified measurements, and give you the DNA of software. You can understand what sort of hygiene is behind it, and the measurements as to how they fare in crash tests. So you can rate 
what that security uh, hygiene that you introduced was the effect. How much did it cost versus what did you realize? And you have government bodies like the FTC that have some notable wins recently. I'm thinking of Wyndham and AT&T in particular, uh, holding some egregiously negligent cases and people responsible for the security practices that they did. 20 years ago, software such as web browsers was a real joke when it came to security. And now, a few of them, notably Google Chrome and of, of all places, Microsoft and Microsoft Edge, are some of the better built products when it comes to security. This has been quantified by nonprofit watch groups, and also it is shown in the disproportionately high cost of underground exploits uh, in the market compared to other quote unquote similar products. Same goes for operating systems. You have Apple iOS, Microsoft Windows 10, and Google's Chrome OS. Examples of, again, quantifiably harder targets than others in similar measurements. Remote exploits against these systems go for hundreds, or hundreds of thousands, or even million dollars a pop sometimes. By comparison, newly exploiting much of the Internet of Things world, or any of the legacy systems that are out there, are literally only a few dollars worth of effort. Operationally, because people think of, forget about operationally as well, we now finally have some examples of companies doing what they do. Take a look at Netflix, take a look at Google in their operations. What do these companies, albeit few in number, share in common? They largely stay away from buying flashy security products because they know that these flashy security products introduce new complexities, introduce new attack surface, and oftentimes do more harm than good. Instead, they focus on counting things like how many lines of code can we reduce and remove from our environment? How much more lean and uh, assurable can we make it? By the way, it makes it faster, too. Similarly, they do a lot of their in-house consulting and they do a lot of their in-house code auditing, partly because most of the uh, commercial entities haven't kept pace with the new continuous integration and continuous development that makes up the modern build life cycle of modern software companies, and also because in the complex machinations that make up these large, large technical companies, they know best what is actually the most important thing that hits their bottom line and affects their customers. So they're able to better score and wait. So those are some examples of good things. How does this information actually help us? Well, in the pockets of consumer watch groups and government uh, organizations providing unbiased data that allow people to make more informed decisions, we can grow this. I mean, there should be more. There should be different ones. Every, I mean, when you bring data to the table, you know, the whole sort of holy wars of this operating system is better or this browser is more secure goes away because data wins. And then similarly, um, with these few orgs, and I'll give uh, some actually more involved examples, you know, that are making products that do meaningful operational security, just study them, measure them, and recreate this in other environments. Let's look at Microsoft, because we picked on Microsoft pretty hard 20 years ago. And it wasn't in my eyes until Windows 10, which is pretty recently, that they made a huge step function. And they actually rolled out security across almost their entire software development lifecycle, build lifecycle, and deploy. Yeah, they've still missed a few. But it is an entirely different target than Windows XP, Vista, 7, etc. And you look over at Apple iOS. This has got some almost million dollar exploits going out for it. Because again, it's a hard uh, target. Partly because they own the entire hardware and software supply chain and tool chain. And you can do some impressive things. And then you've got Google Chrome OS, which has really started to batten down and fuzz the unbelievable heck out of this thing constantly, in addition to modern tool chains, modern compiler settings, and turning on all of the defensive code for building. So they're all similar in many ways. But they all have differences, and each of those has been measured and demonstrated to work. All right, so what do we do about the digital critical infrastructure? SSL. Well, there are protocols and environments that the world has become dependent on, but nobody really wants to pay for and care to secure or can secure. Um, at this point, it's time for the government to actually step up. So this is public safety. So, in closing, I'd like to say two things. One, stop thinking something is secure just because it feels like it should be, and start using data-driven metrics to quantify what that security is. Two, 
The time to accept that security hygiene, critical infrastructure, is a public safety issue and treat it that way was 20 years ago. But the next best time to do it, now. Well, those are some great and I'm sure very durable words uh, when we're back here in circa 20 more years, right? Um, so uh, to keep us moving along, I'm just going to go straight to Kingpin and then uh, hopefully we will still have time for questions. Um, <laughs> just figured I should check just to be safe. Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Joe Grand, also known as Kingpin. I want to give a little bit of sort of a background for those who weren't around 20 years ago. Um, just sort of understand, I'm going to give you a little bit about my history, but also just understand what the loft was about, uh, because we didn't just magically put on a bunch of suits and show up here. <laughs> we didn't have suits. Yeah, we we can buy You, you borrowed your dad's. <laughs> that was my dad's suit, okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I, I was the youngest member of the loft. Still uh, are. Travis Still, Still are. Still are. Still uh, are. Yeah, so anyway, I first got involved in computers and electronics in 1982, seven year old. And back, if you think about back in the 80s, like people didn't just have computers. It was a bunch of different worlds. Oh, that had to either have parents, parents that, that was involved in computers or, or be really lucky. Um, so I just sort of fell in love with, with technology. I had the hard work with it. Look at the work of the system. And compare that to today, where now everybody can reach everybody. I figured out how to make free telephone calls using stolen access to when I was 10 years old. Because phone calls cost money. Away. Uh, it just seemed normal, normal to, to me. Uh, I built my first circuit board when I was 13, the electronic cars. cars. Uh, I could see I was sort of an outlier in law, uh, not only being youngest, youngest but, but also uh, being into the hardware side of things. Trying to yell and scream about hardware, which now, luckily, is a, uh, a valid thing. Um, <laughs> so I sort of tumbled into, I guess what you would call, like, technological juice. Uh, <laughs> until I was about 16 years old. Um, and I got arrested at 16, which really was the turning point for me. Uh, not a lot of that information is public. I did give a talk on it. The whole yes. details of that um, watch at a different time. But the important thing is that admitting though that past is very important, right? Because the security nowadays, that the hacker mindset, you see a lot of people getting into InfoSec that didn't have a background like that. That's okay, but there are a lot of people um, that come from that background, and I think that's okay, that we come from different places and have gotten in trouble and have done questionable things, because that brings all these different perspectives to a community and to an industry that really needs it. You can have, you know, one homogenous group of people have all these different minds. So I also joined the law when I was 16, um, after getting in trouble. That really was that um, kind of redirection where these guys and the guys that aren't here uh, became my mentors. Whether they knew it or not, I was learning from them about the importance of uh, you know, using my passion for the greater good and, and the good side of what hacking can do, and the importance of sharing information, which has you on until today. Uh, and that's something that we can all learn from, regardless of what the information is. It's just sharing it. Somebody somewhere can learn from that. That's a really important lesson. Um, after the loft, uh, I continued still today, independently, kind of wave the flag of hardware and hardware security and kind of the, the the excitement around electronics and, and the things that we rely on day to day, we don't even think about it anymore. We have our phones, we have computers. The room now looks a lot different than it did 20 years ago because we had camera crews and giant cameras. Now people have little cell phones and they record on this tiny little webcam. The technology is everywhere and it's like still fascinating, but we rely on it so much and there's some really big dangers. Uh, so I started my own company after, after the loft and after we started at State called Brand Idea Studio and it really um, about electronics and about hardware hacking and about security of products and trying to get people to think about products, not just using them. Uh, I was on a uh, post of a book called Prototype This on Discovery Channel, which was another way to share engineering and get the next generation of people involved in building and in technology and hopefully we hacking as well. And, uh, you know, hacking for the exploratory part, but hacking from the InfoSec part as well, becoming part of the cybersecurity. Uh, I currently train organizations now on hardware hacking and how to defeat security of hardware products, mostly because securing things is really hard, but also being able to teach people the mindset of hackers so they can then choose the best solutions for their products. Uh, because it's not one solution for everybody. And then, as Spacer said, nothing's ever going to be in there. So if you can think of the way that products are being hacked, 
and say, okay, these are the areas of my particular thing that I need to protect. Um, at the loft, we tried to be the voice uh, and raise awareness for problems. Uh, and um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and uh, hopefully we can. I'm gonna. I have a few kind of sections. I'm not gonna read all of this, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I have two, two different sections. One is sort of a perspective of hardware security, because, like I mentioned, I've been passionate about hardware for a long time. Um, nearly all of what we said 20 years ago holds true. Yes, there have been improvements, but the general classes of problems have been improved. Uh, you know, originally we were talking about the internet as this burgeoning platform. Not everybody even had home computers at that point. Uh, we had desktop computers and servers and some software. And Windows. Um, we, yeah, there was still Apple back then. Space was a big Apple fan. Uh, but now we have the Internet of Things. We have home users plugging in all sorts of devices to their, to their networks. We have industrial control. We have SCADA. Everything is connected to the Internet. And I don't know why that is. I don't know how that became. We had, nobody had anticipated that. All of these devices. The problem is now, instead of having all of these, you know, uh, high resource, high power computer systems that we originally were worried about. Now we have low resource trained devices that have network access that really, in my opinion, don't have the functionality or the capability of even being there. And people are just slapping this stuff in all over the place. It's crazy. So I think what's really changed since a few years ago is the scale of the problem um, because of all of, the, of all of the new devices and our risks now have just exploded. Like Mike just said about all of the critical infrastructure. Everything we're relying on it, and somehow everything is just. Um, what we're also seeing is a lot of traditional software hackers, network hackers, getting into hardware hacking because it's a new platform and it's a new area, it's a new way in. What we're seeing not only in the hacker community but also in nation state level attacks uh, are using hardware as that stepping stone to give you access into a network. Uh, maybe you know, getting some, uh, getting a hard coded credential stored in a piece of the memory on physical piece of electronics that's a network connected device, pull that information off, and then use that with your software style, network style attacks to continue with your attack. So it's not the, it's not just protecting the piece of hardware, it's that you can use that for other things. Very, very interesting uh, kind of perspective. And hardware now is used for, for data exfiltration. Um, it can be uh, simply modified functionality of the device uh, through the Mirai botnet and a bunch of other botnets we've seen with IoT devices. Uh, Used for denial of service. So you have all of these, you know, poorly designed devices that are now compromised by some individual or group of individuals that are now all just sending data at one denial of service and using IoT devices. We're used to just be using network connected computers. That's not um, the, the barrier to entry is low with hardware, and we see news articles all about this. And you know, it, it's almost the uh, black hat and DEFCON season where lots of the presentations come out about computer security and a lot of hardware stuff. Um, none of this stuff should really be a surprise. The design of these systems are not that great. Um, there are some, there are some that are good, uh, but things like there is no basic encryption, no authentication, no code signing to verify that what is running is correct. Um, using default network configurations, hard coded credentials, backdoors, unprotected debug ports, things that we used to refer to as at, at the loft as low hanging fruit. Things that were like so easy, they shouldn't even be allowed to be used to hack something. Um, but that's the case, and I see a few, a few hardware people in the audience that I know, and they're sort of snickering right now because we don't need to have high-tech attacks. 20 years ago, we didn't need to have high-tech attacks. We still don't, for the most part. There are some systems, I would say like game consoles and mobile phones, probably have the best security of consumer devices, and those require groups of amazingly talented people to deliver the security. And though that security created by large companies, you imagine how hard it is for that. Everything else underneath is, is very, very easy. Much had said, actually, uh, 20 years ago, simple security mechanisms are missing. Uh, it's cheaper, it's easier for companies, and they're more reliable. Uh, when vulnerabilities are found, you know, at the loft, we were uh, a lot of times forcing vendors to either fix their problems or say, okay, we're going to release this exploit code, whether you fix a problem or not, so other people can protect themselves. Um, and a lot of times when vulnerabilities are found, it's really easy to blame. blame the people that are working on the products. And I see that a lot with hardware hacking nowadays. I see a lot with other, with other vulnerabilities as well. Oh, that, that person should have known how to configure their network, or known how to, how to build in you know, proper secure process into a, into a design. And I, I think that's not really a cool um, 
expectation because engineers and people that are working on the ground building products are not security professionals. Uh, it's almost two separate worlds, uh, except for a few of us that were lucky to, to kind of have bridge that gap, but most people are trained for engineering or they're trained for Great if those worlds can mix. Uh, and sometimes we see that in conferences, but it really hasn't. So we, we put these expectations on products that we expect to be secure, but they're not. Um, they're, you know, engineers' goals is to get products working, get them done on time, under budget, just like sort of any other process. Uh, security, maybe if they're thinking about it, uh, just kind of um, Another really interesting thing is that engineers are using uh, resources from the vendors. So when an engineer designs a product, they're not working in a little, a little cave somewhere. They're taking information from chip vendors, from module vendors, pieces, the building blocks that make up products. They're going to use whatever the vendor tells them to use to build the product. Those resources, things like reference design, are basically like a recommended of a, of a product. Uh, sample code, here's how you implement crypto for the product. Engineers take that stuff, put it right into their design. They don't vet it. Some, sometimes they do, usually they don't. Uh, and they use it as is. So I think that what we can strive for is less of pointing fingers at engineers and more at, at forcing responsibility onto the vendors and saying, look, if you're selling a chip uh, that does incorporate a secure security feature and you want engineers to use it, why don't you put more resources providing some of this in the background, making it easier for an engineer to use uh, so they don't accidentally make a mistake and implement it correctly, which is a river. So sort of the vendors being able to provide more of that resource where engineers don't have to think as much when they're implementing the system you know, the resources that they're using are going to be better. Uh, Mudge also said 20 years ago, education is one of the largest things that is really missing from out of this. And that's still true. Education really is the thing, but I think it's not necessarily, it is, the, it is at a lower level the engineers, but I think again, the higher level education and having that trickle down to everybody that's involved in the process. Uh, let's see. So, General thoughts on cybersecurity. Um, even with all the problems we're seeing, I know Space Road touched on this as well, and Budget did too, we're seeing you know, still a lot of the same issues, a lot of the same problems, uh, but we are seeing positive change. Uh, lots of researchers now are out there looking for vulnerabilities in products, whether they're external researchers, independent like we were, or working within companies to find problems. And that's pretty amazing, because when we were at the loft, there weren't that many people doing it. When we started at State, we wanted to be an independent research group within a consulting company, and, that, and people didn't know what to do. It was like, Shh, like, what? You want to just find problems and help people fix them, uh, but not do consulting? It was very, a very interesting time. But now people are doing that, and it really is helping the process of finding these problems and trying to bring more education to everybody, which is great. Uh, the bug bounty programs. Uh, there's even bug bounty programs and, and companies uh, that will help other companies that don't have the resources to do bug bounties and provide incentivized, uh, you know, kind of uh, disclosure or how to deal with uh, deal with the hackers, uh, which is great because not everybody knows how to deal. A lot of hackers don't know how to deal with vendors properly, so it's really interesting. Uh, a lot of vendors are becoming responsive to the fact that there are, are security problems in their products. Uh, you know, we always joked about it, like we're basically you're basically calling up somebody's baby ugly when you find a security problem in somebody's product. And that's a really hard thing. Now that I have kids, it's like, I would hate if somebody called my baby ugly. <laughs> <laughs> but you can do it in a very tactfully way, tactful way. Um, I think a friend of mine said to me, wow, you're baby, like an alien. <laughs> and like, he didn't say ugly, but he said alien. And like, I thought that was actually cool because aliens are like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> a certain way, right? And that's, that's what I'm getting at. Is you, you don't have to just come in and say, I'm a hacker, I'm better, I found a problem. There's a way to do things properly. The vendors are, are becoming responsive. This really great. Um, and some companies are really good, good approaches, good attempts at security. Um, we just need more of that. And I think, like I mentioned, the scale of things, there's this many people doing things that are right, and there's this many people that are getting involved in doing things that are wrong. Um, we also have a security versus convenience that we talked about way back in the day, and that's still true. Uh, it's sort of human nature that there's a security mechanism in place uh, that inconveniences an end user, the end user is going to figure out a way to get around it. Same thing with designing security into products. If it's inconvenient or if it's not easy enough for a designer to do, they're not going to do it. Um, and that's just human nature. So I, I just threw this in. I wasn't, I wasn't actually expecting to quote Donald Trump today. Uh, <laughs> 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 
the opportunity is to create. What he said, I just read this in the, okay, he said this yesterday, um, is that it was too inconvenient to swap out the phone he uses for Twitter to check for signs of compromise. That's the end. So he's basically choosing to live with the risk of having a hacked phone because he feels inconvenience is more important than security. That exemplifies the actual reality of security versus convenience. And this is a big problem for security engineers. We deal with this all the time. Because security is hard, and doing it in a way that people are going to use is even harder. And the fact that the president, who's possibly the most targeted person in the world, doesn't want to trade his phone, makes him really think about, is anybody else going to do that, and why should they? Um, and that leads to my final point, is attacks have become so commonplace that we're desensitized to what's happening out there. Um, and people just don't really seem to be as surprised or as concerned with like, oh, there's been a new hack, a new breach, a new whatever. Uh, because it's just, you know, we see, we see it all the time. We see branded exploits, we see logos for things. Like, we didn't name our exploits back in the day. I think we had a title, but no name. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a really big thing. So the exploits, we get the media frenzy about whatever new breach has happened. Uh, and then the users or the customer, customers get placated in some way. Oh, we care about your privacy or your data. We'll, we'll do something about it. Uh, but then stock prices end up going, going up, the world keeps turning, and then we move on to the next attack. So it's really like, um, it's, almost, it's almost a problem because we're so used to being hacked that we almost don't want to go, go, go around and fix it. <laughs> uh, right, great from the testimony. It really is, it really is that thing. So, um, yeah, you know, I live and breathe sort of hacker ethic. Hackers have done great things, um, and they'll continue to do great things. But the pessimist in me, and people might, might hate me for saying this, is that I think cybersecurity has become like any other big business. And maybe it was 20 years ago, and I just didn't see it because I was too young. Um, but if you think about the healthcare industry, animal agriculture industry, the war industry, um, as long as there's huge amounts of money to be made, either from the good side, so say the defense protection side, or the bad side, criminal elements, nation states, whatever, um, we might never reach a happy ending. See, this perpetual problem, I really think that's going happen. So anyway, thanks for listening. Um, I look forward to the rest of our discussion uh, if we have time. So. We, we do have time. Uh, I've been told that we are not going to get kicked out of this room in four minutes, so that's, that's a bonus. Um, one little bit of housekeeping. Apparently, the last two mics don't really work. Um, very well. So everyone in the room, you've enjoyed, <laughs> you've enjoyed a very rare treat, um, but uh, apparently those last two mics. So for the rest of the panel, if you guys can sure. share the first two, um, and then we can get more, uh, more of those words that, that we're hanging on. Luckily, I've been watching the Twitter. Hardware is hard, right? Yeah. I've been, luckily, I've been watching the Twitter, and uh, a lot of people who are live tweeting have been quoting you guys. So not, all is not lost and left to the official record. Um, before we move into audience questions, I want to, you know, just kind of pull back for a second and remark upon the fact that, you know, Joe, you were calling out the fact that we have, we have, you know, these hardware classes of attack that are the same as they were 20 years ago, and we've also seen a lot of technology, um, you know, and a lot of vendors that didn't consider themselves software companies or hardware companies, you know, we, moving into the space of actually having to secure hardware and software. And I want to make the point that, you know, in the world that we had 20 years ago, the internet was so much smaller than it is today. And we still were having, you know, a chase the technical debt problem back then at the scale that we were back then. Um, we were, as hackers, learning how to not exactly blend, but how to communicate with the people that we needed to convince to do something. Some of it was through, you know, full disclosure, and some of it was through, you know, more diplomatic means. And to, to this day, I feel like we've got, you know, we've got a long road ahead of us, but if we capture the principles that we had to learn in the early days and start applying them to em the emerging technologies before they've all taken over, it may sound like it's too late, but you know, as Mudge said eloquently, you know, the best time to have done it would have been 20 years ago. It's never too late to start, um, especially applying those lessons to the newer technologies and the newer, uh, the newer areas. So now that you guys have rearranged your microphones, um, I want to see if there are any audience questions uh, for this group of people, from people who are maybe not descended from them. Hold on, we'll get to you, bud. We'll get to you. Okay, over there. The 
the question was, uh, how does the Internet of Things define us and does it need to be legislated for those who are watching the stream? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I don't know what can be legislated. Uh, I, I don't know if, I, I have no idea. Um, but I think the... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll tell no. you what can be done. I mean, but, the, yeah, I, th the I think the... The important thing is the important thing is education, and I don't think you can legislate forcing somebody to a vendor to sort of educate their their customers. Maybe you can try to hold them accountable for providing some set of resources. There, it's a very complicated issue because even if you have implemented a checkbox full of do this, do this, do this, like FIPS 140 compliance for for cryptographic devices, it doesn't mean you're totally secure, but it gets you to a level that's a lot better. So maybe. If you have to, if there is some legislation, maybe it's about um, just getting to some minimal level and not just pushing out products without thinking about anything at all. One, I think one thing that can definitely happen is the FTC has a lot of power in this space and can bring their weight to bear against certain companies as set an example to other companies to make secure products. Uh, FTC is a good one. Um, I, I'm going to challenge the statement that like FIPS 140 and the other ones make things better. Because actually, we haven't seen that to be the case. In fact, EAL certifications of higher levels explicitly call out that higher levels of cert certification, much like FIPS 140 2, have no actual bearing on the safety and security of the end product. They're more about nomenclature and they're about processes and they're about interoperability. One imagines those things should make it better, and we, you know, we'd like to think it does, but when you actually go measure, we don't have any actual evidence that shows that a FIPS 140-2 product, which I've popped a bunch of them, are any more difficult than non-FIPS 140-2 certifications. What I would really like to see with the Internet of Things is we've been tearing apart uh, Cyber ITL, which is the part of um, the nonprofit that I'm the chairperson of, um, works with consumer reports on the digital, digital standard. And we've been tearing apart TVs and other stuff because they've been more interested in IoT. How can they inform their consumers as to, you know, which TV maybe has, you know, better hygiene than others if it becomes a risk? You know, wouldn't you like to, all things even, if the TVs cost the same amount, buy the one that's a little bit more costly to the adversary to actually take over and enlist in a botnet or something? And for me, Internet of Things is really broken down into two classes. There's one which is a shrunken down, full-blown desktop operating system. It's just a Linux system on a small ARM processor or something. And there's another one which is an actual honest to goodness like RTOS on an embedded system. And they're very difficult. And one of the things we haven't quantified, but it, by, at least by having the government say, hey, you gotta show your, you know, you gotta show your bill of materials, you gotta show your software bill of materials, you have to show your nutritional label of what's inside this, we can start to quantify does having a much, much smaller footprint with much less functionality on that RTOS, assuming you don't have like no passwords needed, actually make it a harder target? Or can you actually take this shrunken down large million lines of code thing, which we know is a large target, and use some of the tools that we've built up for hardening and defensive purposes? So if people can start to see what's inside, we can actually get measurements as to what's being exploited, what the cost is, and we can start making informed decisions as to not buying that crap. Unless you're the president, in which case you're going to still buy that, right? Well, uh, on the yeah. phone? Well, actually, that, that's a fun one because the, secu the, the iPhone that, uh, uh, that was used by Obama didn't come from NSA. That came from DARPA. That came from Dino DeZovi, and it came from myself. And that's, I hope, at least the same one that, uh, <laughs> that POTUS is using now. No, I think the article said that, that one for Twitter is not. I don't always <laughs> believe the news Well, yeah, we shouldn't. <laughs> Um, but to get back to your, regular, your initial question about legislation, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I would argue that legislation is probably not needed, but that action through the FDA and other government agencies is an action through the cyber ITL to inform consumers will help, and that the market will eventually correct itself, hopefully, and that if it doesn't, then we can start looking at legislation. Or other ones. It doesn't have to be cyber ITL. Any, any of these groups, they just have to start putting data out. So there's a, there's a standard, not a standard, but recommendations in the UK called Secure by Design for IoT manufacturers. And it kind of goes along with what you know, Joe was saying, like get rid of the low hanging fruit. Like at least get rid of the really, really dumb stuff. Because there's, there's no reason, that, there's no reason a manufacturer doesn't do the really dumb stuff today. They can. So the whole hard coded password thing, we all know that's really, really bad, right? Um, the software not being able to be updated, like that's, really bad, and I'm sure we could quantify these things too. Um, and 
and uh, you know the the bill of materials like shipping with known vulnerable components or, 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 or components that can't be upgraded we all know those things are bad so we can have some baselines that can we always just say this at the loft raise the bar like always be thinking about how do you go from like crappy security to slightly less crappy security <laughs> mm -hmm. and it actually makes a difference right if you had like you know 50 botnet attacks a year instead of a hundred that's making progress this thing of like having a silver bullet that fixes all the security problems at one time through one regulation doesn't make any sense we don't do that any anywhere else but if we incrementally keep making improvements once we know things are bad like hard-coded passwords just try to eliminate the things we know are bad do you think, I mean, do you think, following on that question, do you think everything in terms of secure best practices that we've learned in the older world of more traditional server and client computing, do you think all of it applies? This is a trick question. I have opinions, too. Trick question. Go. <laughs> I think a lot of the software, uh, the, the sort of the secure by design, like um, uh, thinking about security from the beginning that we, you know, recommend you do if you're building software also translates over to the IoT world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like every generation of technology that we go through, we're relearning the same lessons, right? So we, we have uh, the old mainframe and client server days and we moved to the desktop days. We had to relearn everything. From desktop, we go to mobile. We relearn all the same lessons again. Now we're at IoT and we're starting over from scratch. Because in each iteration, the, the people that are involved, the manufacturers that are involved, don't have the security background, don't have the history of the lessons that were learned before. And so we're basically starting from scratch, and then we all come in and try to tell them, oh, you're doing it wrong. Well, we never showed them how to do it right in the first place. So, mm. it, it also depends on what you really mean by what we assume security by design is or, or what we think is secure. And I'll give a few examples. You know, a lot of folks think layering extra security solutions on top of the problem makes it more secure. And in many cases, it doesn't. It increases the code size, it increases the complexity, and it increases the chance for vulnerabilities to be introduced. We largely know that in the community when it comes to antivirus at this point. In fact, when we were doing pen tests at the loft, I used to love when I saw a semantic box because I knew I could get in because it had semantic on it. <laughs> and now we're seeing a very similar thing. They only bought at stake. Shh. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um, We're free. We, We're free now. We have some good McAfee bugs, too. Uh, I don't remember those, but okay. Um, that similarly, with things that are called, like, next generation, you know, secure, we've, we've watched foreign nation states go into the major vendors that have them. And it's actually, so a lot of this is counterintuitive. You would say, I want to buy the latest and greatest, and it feels secure because it feels better to buy complex things than it actually does to reduce and simplify my environment. And when I buy the complex thing that all the other big targets have, an attacker, we know this, this is the cost of the attacker goes down. Because now all I have to do is figure out how to exploit it once, and I get all of those targets. So doing something more simplistically and doing it somewhat uniquely, which we might have even referred to a little bit as security through obscurity, ends up having a value. So there's a lot of counterintuitive things into what's actually secure when you look at it and what's not. So yeah, I, secure by design is, is a very double-edged sword. Yeah, and I think I think we, you know, we've always been touching on that that balance between the convenience and the innovation, right? The the United States invented the internet, and all of the things that have grown up, um, you know, with these internet-enabled technologies are the things that we were trying to put forward as leaders in the technology space ourselves. So that balance between build it fast and build it well and securely are, are you know, it's a big deal. Um, my trick question was about, you know, do all best practices from general computing apply in all environments? And my uh, counter example actually came from Bo Woods, who's in the audience, I think it came from him. I'm gonna blame you, Bo, uh, which is that um, you want to have uh, something in place, generally speaking, to avoid um, brute forcing of passwords, except, you know, some sort of a locking. But you don't want that happening in an ER necessarily with, you know, with a, a computing device that is there to help save a life. So there are some use cases and we should examine where those seams are a little bit different as we're trying to carry these lessons forward. Um, another question from the audience, please. Whoa, okay, wow. Somebody was incredibly enthusiastic back there, so I'm gonna go first.
So the question for for the folks who are for the folks who are watching the stream, who are very very attentively watching, the question was: Does existing legislation uh, impede security research? And the example given was the Digital Millennium Copyrights Act, and I believe you had an oblique reference to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Are we in fact too cautious with trying to impede bad actors, where we are discouraging the good security research? Take it away. Well, mm -hmm. so the, the the legislation that you mentioned, the Computer Fraud Abuse Act, the the DMCA, there's a couple other ones as well, are all rather old. Right, they're older than 20 years. 1985. Yeah, 85, 86, that time frame. Um, and they were written at a time when the internet and computers, well, they weren't even thinking about the internet at the time. So they're also very broad because they weren't defined, the definitions that they used weren't really, they didn't know what they were defining. So they figured, oh, we're just gonna include everything. Uh, as a result, uh, in my opinion anyway, the laws are overused by overzealous prosecutors. And as a result of that, we end up with uh, a lot of people who get charged with crimes who maybe shouldn't be. Um, and so if I think that there was some change in legislation that should happen, I would like to revisit those laws and either rewrite them or, or pass new laws to over supersede them so that we have better definitions for, that apply for today and tomorrow. Uh, and narrow the scope of what those laws cover. I don't know if anybody else so wants I'm to pretty add. sure every, does everybody agree on this panel, generally speaking? Because I want to get to a few more questions. We're I, I, so I, I, over time. I have something okay. real quick on this. Okay, so real quick. D, with one thing on DMCA, one thing on CFAA and ECPA, and I'll explain why they have to be used together. Um, DMCA was largely to prevent the theft of intellectual property and to prevent people from thinking that they lose money. Most of the um, financial and, uh, and the econ studies on this show that that's actually not the case. And if you're getting no copy protection and theft, that you weren't making money anyway, look at why nobody, you know, pirated Windows Vista. Um, so, <laughs> and, and through that, they ended up cutting out a lot of research and we fought very hard with a lot of people from Matt Blaze to Marsha Hoffman, et cetera, to make sure and many, many others that there are some carve out. Those carve outs are narrow. They need to be larger. That doesn't actually, from any empirical uh, information or evidence, show that that's causing DMCA, you know, causing loss of money to, uh, to IP owners. CFAA, to space Earth's point, 1985, it's been modified several times. It's been updated, but it's relatively naive. A lot of pe people attack it because it's, it's used selectively um, and it's used unevenly. What folks don't seem to realize is that if you changed CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, that would affect the Electronic Communications and Privacy Act as well. They are both intertwined. And justice uses the ECPA a lot. So if you wonder why there's so much pushback on CFAA modifications, it might be because somebody else is very vested in ECPA. We would have to approach both of them simultaneously. Well, I'm just not going to call upon the member of the DOJ who's in the audience to either confirm nor deny that. Um, Kingpin, did you have something real quick to add to this one? I, I was just going to say, more to Space Rogue's point, yes, it, we live in a very litigious society, right? So it's, it's not just these large cases that you hear about in the news. It's researchers are scared to look at things, and they're scared to break things. Now that I have kids and I don't want to go to jail, um, I'm very nervous now. I'm very nervous when I look at, I'm nervous when I look at products because of those laws, they're so huge and it really does squelch our community. It squelches the research community and it's super scary. And I think that's gonna prevent innovation as well because if researchers can't hack on things and explore and try to fix things, we're never gonna see the right solutions come out of it. Okay, we did, had- Did anybody hear the FireEye story and what happened to them when they tried to squash the researchers? Uh, I don't think we have story time time. Ah. But for those who it, it are watching, many more zero days. Yeah, mm. well, that's true. You know, the, the, that to that point, um, you know, angering a swarm of researchers is like inviting a bunch of bees to your picnic, right? Um, right. That's true. So, um, so there was a question, uh, I believe, right here. Cool. 
Well, if you're using AOL, you don't we deserve to visit our website. Someone leaching so many files that no one else could get on, and we said it's all these AOL Sir. people anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it was just him. Now we know. <laughs> All right, so for those watching the stream, uh, a, a young person at the time was inspired <laughs> oh. by. <laughs> and that's really all I think right? that we were trying to do. Yes. <laughs> oh, and, oh, and it's an autograph of a handset. That's amazing. OK, I was not expecting that to happen. There was another question from this general area um, who raised hands. Just you. No. No, <laughs> while they're, while they're signing their, their fan piece. OK, go ahead. So for the stream, uh, the question was, how far should you get, should you allow new technology to develop before you start regulating it? And one example that was given was cryptocurrency. Folks. We, sh we should allow it to go just as far and so that we don't have Skynet. <laughs> That's where we stop it. <laughs> and if you've gotten to Skynet, you know you went too far, is that, is that what it is? Yeah, well then you can't tell and it's too late, yeah. Um, anytime it's a public safety issue, I mean, you should at least think about it. That's part of what the government is, is for, and that's part of the government's responsibility. I'll tell you a, a, a flip side of that, which is on the researcher side, many of you are, are familiar with Charlie Muller and Chris Valachek's uh, car hacking. What you might not know is that actually was spawned out of Cyber Fast Track, which is something I ran at DARPA. And in the contract, I mandated that they had to release all of the tools and the capabilities entirely publicly. And guess what? No malicious hacks have come from that and a lot of positive defensive mechanisms and a lot of public awareness and a lot of changes in those places. So, you know, when do you need to regulate it? I don't know. But when do you need to actually really start attacking it? Right away. Okay, so we are at 15 minutes over time. Um, I, I know that there are going to be a couple of you know, sort of wrapping remarks, but I want to take a moment to thank all of you for filling this room and showing up in person. A lot of friendly faces here and a lot of faces who uh, we didn't know were friendly until they, you know, had, had, the, had the guys sign the handset. Um, uh, John Price from Senator Gardner's office is, uh, is going to wrap some things up. I sub or well, he looks surprised. Maybe I am. <laughs> But uh, I do want to thank you very much and uh, definitely thank the coalition for hosting us here and um, for whomever is responsible for making that giant photo, which I call the loft supper in Mudge We Trust. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all. And uh, I want to turn it over to John and thank you to the loft. Let's Hang give on, it we up. Have a, we, have a, we have a prop. Yeah. Right. You have the prop? Uh, yeah, so real quick, just on behalf of Senator Gardner and Senator Warner, uh, I wanted to thank Weld Pond, Mudge, uh, Space Rogue, and Kingpin uh, for your remarks today, and also you, Katie. Thank you very much for taking your time out of your day, and for everyone else for showing up. That's it. Should do that for our, for our replication picture. Photo of now, quick before he takes it off. Oh, look at all the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Hold it out, man. Hold it out. Put it back. There you go. Yeah. Right. That's the guy I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. John, are we gonna do the? Are we gonna do the replication of when everyone? Yeah, I want to get. Yeah, you have the real hair. Hold up, it's too close to that. There we go. Let me take this off and take it in the back. Here, move these over.
should. You guys have to get behind your... Or we should do this one. Or can they put it right in front of you? All right, so. These we have to move. Put the water in the way. I expected so it to just like line by line go through the entire previous test. <laughs> it really was a lot of, well, I listened to it. I know, I, and I, was I like, noticed. Oh my God. It's like, it's shocking. I'm like, hey, John. Why don't you sit here with who's, with Welds, right? Mm -hmm. But you should sit back there with his thing and get a picture taken. Have him. Sit in the chair. Yeah, my phone's been Come blowing on. up. Like yeah. it's a. Bzz, 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 bzz. Hey, how's it going? Of course I do. How are you doing, Andrew? Look up! Look up! Look up! Look up! Yeah, he only told me about it like two days ago. So yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, like, mm. I'm like, well, I, I'm only at two and a half right now with the train ride, so I gotta closed, make so sure they don't say something stupid. No, okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Oh, Randy, it's been a long time. I saw you. I'm like, I'm bonding with this guy. <laughs> yep. I have one of your old cards laying around still, too. Been doing good. Yourself? Do you have any questions? You still live? Yep. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yep, yep. Well, he's just like, you know, sitting back there drinking uh, with, um, uh, uh, Larry Blankenship out in Florida, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, were you were you Navy with? Uh, uh, I didn't know how much it took. Like, I mean Army. I didn't know. If, I, was, uh, a couple of things, I keep saying know. Navy because I kept bumping into him out at Navy postgraduate school. Yeah. yeah. yeah when when was, he was, was Army was there. Before. Gotcha. Echo. Echo. Got it. Echo. Got it. Hey, I know you got long. I got some I'd like you to do. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I can just. Oh yeah, okay. You want me to? Hello. Right after I did. Yeah. 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 Yeah.